Hello to our friends joining us via recording. Today is our last live class session. We are reviewing for the final exam one more time together. So for our review, we got together and worked in some groups. Again, we're gonna go over those group activities and cover a few more uh, topics that we didn't discuss with, with our groups. Let's start with a review of a unit number one topic we when i was bouncing between my groups i heard a lot of us say like oh my gosh this was so long ago like a year ago <laughs> so it, it has been quite a while since we talked about things like diffusion osmosis or active transport hopefully now that we're at the end of the semester we can see why uh, we had to talk about these things because these kinds of things really informed especially when we were talking about things like neurons and muscle cells these are the kinds of things that had to be right for those parts of the body to function correctly. So let's review these important ideas, see what we can remember from unit number one. When we talk about the processes of diffusion, osmosis, and active transport, we talked about these as the way that a cell can move things across their membrane. So the goal of transport is to get stuff that's on the outside to the inside or stuff that's on the inside to the outside. Remember that the function, the big picture, most important function of the plasma membrane is to divide inside and outside. We need it to be different for a cell to be able to function. When we talk about the kinds of things that can move across the membrane, we could either move water or some kind of liquid or we could move the stuff that's dissolved in in that liquid or that water Let, let's start with saying that i'm trying to move water which of of my processes up here did we specifically talk about was the one that helped me to move water which one moved water yeah exactly so when we talked about osmosis in the process of osmosis, water moves across the plasma membrane. Now we have a technical name. It could conceivably not just be water. Uh, it, it could be something else that really you'd only use in a chemistry class. Uh, the te technical fancy word that we use for what moves in osmosis is our solvent. The thing that I use to dissolve things, which again, in the body, we're only ever dissolving stuff in water. So in osmosis, water moves across the plasma membrane. In diffusion, what's the fancy word for what I'm moving in diffusion? Yeah, exactly. So it's my, my other, my other soul word, right? The thing's called the solutes. So the solutes are the dissolved things. In diffusion, they're what's moving. In osmosis, it's the liquid that they're dissolved in. That is, is what's moving. Now, if we're just talking about straight up normal diffusion, so uh, not facilitated diffusion, if I'm just doing normal diffusion, what kind of chemistry words would I use to describe normal diffusion? So we're gonna have, I'm gonna call it normal, and then I'm gonna put facilitated underneath it because we should mention both of those things. Facilitated. Yeah, so Kira listed a bunch for us. The, the big one that I, that maybe the big two that I wanna land on are nonpolar and hydrophobic. Gotta remember our chemistry words, right? So nonpolar, we talked about nonpolar covalent bonds in class last week. Nonpolar means we have no charge, we're sharing equally. If we have no charge and we're sharing equally, we don't play nice with water, we're hydrophobic. When I do normal diffusion, as in I'm not doing facilitated diffusion, I don't have a protein facilitator, these are the kinds of things I can move. Also, like Kira mentioned, things that are small can go this way. Uh, nonpolar means the same thing as lipid soluble, et cetera. We can do facilitated diffusion, facilitated diffusion, my other kind of diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, I'm going to, I'm going to bounce down for a moment here. Remember that facilitated diffusion 
is the type of diffusion where we do use proteins. That's how it gets its name. So if I'm doing diffusion, but I have to use a protein channel to transport things, that's facilitated diffusion. The reason I sometimes have to do facilitated diffusion and can't just do normal diffusion is because in facilitated diffusion, some other kinds of solutes move. This is where we start to see those polar solutes moving. So things that have, have dipoles. This would also be where I see ions moving, things that have a full charge. This would also be where I'd see things that are hydrophilic, which is my opposite of hydrophobic, right? Hydrophilic. So all of these things can move using the process of facilitated diffusion. In normal diffusion, these are my only options here. When we talk about the process of diffusion, do we go from low to high or high to low when we're doing diffusion? What direction are we going? Yeah, exactly. So when I do diffusion, I'm going from high to low. So we're moving things from where there's a lot of them to where there's not as many of them. This process, going from high to low, by definition, if I go from high to low, that makes this an example of passive transport. That word passive transport tells me whether or not I need energy. Do I need energy for diffusion, for passive transport in general? Yeah, exactly. There, there is no energy involved when we're doing diffusion whether it's facilitated diffusion or just regular diffusion, no energy required because I'm always transporting things from high to low. Now I should go back to our table and mention that if I'm doing normal diffusion, I do not use proteins for that. So typically when we're talking about, when I just use the word diffusion, I mean you're going straight through the plasma membrane. No protein required, you can sneak straight in. I will use the term facilitated diffusion if we're talking about something that uses a protein to get inside. Does it matter if you use a protein or if you don't use a protein? You never need energy to get inside. When we talk about the process of osmosis, does osmosis need energy? Is this one active or passive? Osmosis. Yeah, no, no energy for osmosis either. So still no energy, still passive transport. Definitely spelled that wrong. Oh, well. Still passive transport, no energy required. If I know that there's no energy required, that tells me that, again, we're going from high to low. We're going downhill, down the slope. Osmosis is a little bit tricky for this question here. When we talk about water, do you all remember, was water polar or nonpolar? Do we happen to remember what water was, polar or nonpolar? So if you remember, water was one of them that we, we had our little, let's see how well I can draw with my mouse here. I'm way better at drawing penguins, just saying. <laughs> When we were looking at water, remember that we drew ourselves that electron cloud that was real dark up here and real light down here? Water is, this is a terrible drawing, I'm so sorry. <laughs> water is an example of a polar compound. Polar compounds do facilitated diffusion, so polar compounds use proteins. When we're talking about osmosis, most of the water that comes in and out of your cells, most of it is going to use a protein to get in and out. Um, I, to be fully honest, I'm not going to ask you about that on the exam, um, but there are special kind of proteins that we didn't really talk about called aquaporins. Aquaporins. That's the special kind of protein that I use to get water into and out of the cell. 
So water mostly comes into and out of the cell using these special channel proteins that allow it to go from high, where there's a lot of water to where there's just a little bit of water. When we start talking about active transport, active transport, what does its name tell me about it? If it's active transport, what, if it's, what does its name tell us? Yeah, exactly. It, its name tells us the most important thing for us to know about it is energy is required. Energy is required. If energy is required, that tells me that something that's moving is going to go the opposite direction, right? Something is going to go from low to high. Now, I know I saw at least one of my groups, probably more of my groups, talking about how there's, there's more than one way for us to use energy to, to move things. So we should do a little bit of breaking down here. We've got what's called primary active transport, and we've got secondary active transport. In primary active transport, when we talk about the way that things move, let me make myself some little gradients here. When we talk about primary active transport, in primary active transport, I have two molecules that both go up their concentration gradient. So I've got two things that are going from where there's not a lot of them to where there's already a lot of them. When I do primary active transport, since two things are going uphill, what kind of energy do I have to use for primary? active transport. Make a little note down here. Primary active transport. Yeah, exactly. In primary active transport, we use ATP. So ATP is my chemical energy. This is what a cell makes so that it can break it down. We store it and use it, ATP. When both of the things that are moving are both going uphill, I have no choice. I'm going to have to spend some energy money to make it happen. In secondary active transport, we actually have two molecules that are moving different directions. So check this out. In secondary active transport, something is going from high to low. Because something is going from high to low, we're able to sneak something else from low to high. So the example that, that we did with this was the sodium glucose co-transporter. Sodium goes from where there's a lot to where there's a little, from outside to inside, a lot to a little. That allows us to take glucose, which there's a little on the outside, and bring it inside where there's already a lot. When we talk about secondary active transport, I don't have to use the energy of ATP. What I use for secondary active transport is, is somebody else's energy. So for secondary active transport, we'll say another concentration gradient. And the best analogy I can think of when we talk about secondary active transport, remember how you drew that example of those boulders on the hill, right? So here's our little valley. Remember that if one rock rolls down one side, the energy that's released because that rock rolled down is going to allow the one that's down here at the bottom, it's going to allow that one to have the energy it needs to go up the hill. So secondary active transport, somebody is going downhill from high to low. That's going to allow somebody else to go from low to high. Secondary active transport. When we talk about active transport, do I need proteins to do this? Are proteins involved in active transport? Yes, they are. Yep. We, we have to use proteins to do active transport. 
Yeah, in particular, like Kira mentioned, the kind of proteins that we use to do active transport are called carrier proteins. Carrier proteins. And here's a reminder for us <clears throat> when we talk about carrier proteins, they attach to the, I'm just going to say they're attached to the thing. <laughs> they attach to what they're transporting, the thing that they're carrying across the membrane. When we were talking about facilitated diffusion, when we were talking about osmosis, those would be examples of when we use channel proteins. They might be gated channels. Sometimes the channel might be closed, but as soon as the channel opens, these things are gonna pass straight through. They're never going to attach to the proteins. In active transport, we definitely attach to what we're, we're transporting. That's the only way we can move things the wrong direction. The only way we can do active transport. The only thing we haven't filled in on our table yet is this space right here. What were some of the things that we, we remembered that we used active transport to move in the body? We already talked about, about one of them. Yeah, so uh, glucose. Glucose, we're definitely going to get into our cells using secondary active transport. Yeah, and then we're, we're going to use... Uh, active transport to also move for us sodium and potassium. Those were the things, remember, that were part of the sodium potassium pump. Yeah, so um, earlier Brittany had mentioned polar things through active transport. Yeah, glucose is an example of a polar thing. Absolutely, glucose is polar. Uh, and sodium and potassium are ions, right? So uh, notice that the kinds of things that we move with active transport are the kinds of things that, that would need a protein to get across the membrane anyway. The difference, though, between facilitated diffusion and active transport is the fact that we're going the wrong direction. So if I wanted to move glucose from inside the cell to outside, if I was just moving it, doing facilitated diffusion, I'm going to spit out all my glucose. If I was, was doing facilitated diffusion, go from where there's a lot of it to where there's a little. That's not helpful if my cell wants to hoard all of the sugar it can find, right? We're to that point in the semester. We're hoarding all the sugar we can find. So, <laughs> yeah, which the cell does and which we do because, you know, we're staying awake for three days straight to prepare for anatomy. We're hoarding all our sugar. If we're doing that, we're doing active transport. We are, are actively seeking it out, as opposed to letting our children or our friends or anyone else steal that sugar that we've so carefully hoarded for ourselves. So when we are, are bringing polar things against their concentration gradient, we do active transport. If we are bringing things that are polar down their concentration gradient, I can just do facilitated diffusion for that. I can just use what's called those channel proteins. We'll put a note here. Channel proteins. I can use those both for diffusion and for osmosis. Thumbs up on this table. How do we feel about, about our quick compare and contrast? Awesome. Okay. So I can't remember if I included these pictures in the guided lesson or not, but I just want to point out for you, we just talked about the difference between diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Remember how in diffusion, things just go straight through the membrane. That's regular diffusion, or I think we called it normal diffusion. Facilitated diffusion we're still going from high concentration to low concentration. So it's still passive transport. It's still diffusion. But remember that we use a protein facilitator to do that. And that protein facilitator, remember, is a channel protein, meaning that it's, it's always open. Both sides of the channel are open and snuff will just sneak right through. I might put a gate on the outside, but as soon as I open that gate, stuff just goes straight through from high to low. If I'm going, though, from low to high, like we see down here, we'd be doing active transport. So the biggest thing I wanted to point out was this difference up here. Regular diffusion, 
versus facilitated diffusion. It's all about that protein facilitator. I know I gave you this picture. Uh, so this picture shows us the kinds of things that we move. So this is kind of the basis for that activity that, that we started with today. So remember that in diffusion, we go from high concentration to low concentration. We're going down the, the gradient. This is what we do with those nonpolar things, with those lipid soluble things, diffusion from high to low. We can do osmosis with water, going from where there's a lot of water to where there's a little bit of water. Or we can just throw it all out and go up the hill. If we're going from low concentration to high concentration, that's going to take me energy. That's why we do active transport. Hey, here's the good news for you. If you haven't already noticed on the list of learning objectives for the final exam, I am not making you relearn your tonic words. So by tonic words, I mean hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic. I'm not going to ask you which way water would move in a hypertonic solution, all that kind of stuff. So uh, in case you were doing your studying and, and you were remembering, uh, I am not going to make you review those tonic words. You'll have to know them come AMP2 when you start talking about the ways that the kidneys work. Uh, you'll have to refresh on those words, but I'm gonna, I'm, I know I'm a mean teacher, but I'm gonna give you a pass on that one. So one less thing to study for the exam. <laughs> All right, let's look at the next thing that we did with our groups. The next thing we talked about in our groups were some of the things that uh, we find in the skin. So some reminders for us about the different parts of the skin. Now remember, and I'll show you a picture here in just a minute, remember that technically the dermis has two parts to it. There's the upper part that's called the papillary layer. Papillary layer of the dermis. That's my upper part that actually touches the outer part of the skin called the epidermis. And then we've got that really thick reticular layer of the dermis as well. So these questions were a little bit more broad, but technically speaking, there's two parts to the dermis. All right, let's start with our first statement here. When we are talking about the layers of the skin that have adipose tissue, this is actually a lab review for us, where did we find the adipose tissue in the skin? Which of these layers had adipose tissue? Yeah, it was my, my deep one right here. I gotta, gotta do an adipose realistic color here. We're in the orange. The hypodermis is the location of adipose tissue in the skin. Hey, while we're at it, let's remind ourselves about the other layers. When I talk about the epidermis, this is really mean um, to ask you to type. Let's start with this. Which of the four main tissue types? Oh man, Kira is so fast. <laughs> she types it all. Four main tissue types. When we talk about the epidermis, we have epithelial tissue, my covering and lining tissue. The specific kind of epithelial tissue that I have out here in the epidermis like Brittany mentioned, this is keratinized epithelial tissue. We call it keratinized stratified squamous, more than one layer of flat cells, and it is a type of epithelial tissue. Keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. That's the big, long, fancy name for the type of tissue in the epidermis. Hey, based on its name, what molecule do we have a whole lot of in the epidermis based on its name? Yeah, exactly. Its name tells me the answer to that question. All the keratin that I find in the skin is in the epidermis. The epidermis is where I have keratin. All right, let's go back to the dermis. Remember that the dermis has two parts. So when I talk about the papillary layer, of the dermis. This is the layer that's up higher in the dermis. So the papillary layer of the dermis 
has areolar loose connective tissue. I'm going to abbreviate. Areolar loose connective tissue. This was the one, if you remember from lab, that had a lot of open space to it. We had some cells and then kind of some fuzzy proteins mixed in all over the place. That's different from the reticular layer of the dermis. If you remember, that had dense, irregular connective tissue. Dense, irregular connective tissue. That was the one that looked really ugly. It was those pink spots and lines that are going all kinds of directions. That's the reticular layer of the dermis. So the question only asked us about adipose, but a good idea just to remind yourself of the four different types of tissue that we find in the skin. And take a quick peek. If you use your, your lecture packet, it has pictures of these types of tissues. Just remember what they look at like to make sure we're, we're familiar with them again. When we talk about the parts of the skin, let me flip the question on its head here. Which of these layers do we know does not have blood supply? Who would we say is avascular? I'm gonna put that word on the side here. We used this word before. Yeah, when we talk about things being avascular, the epidermis is avascular. That word avascular means no blood vessels, no blood vessels. Oh, that should not have been a circle. So sorry. <laughs> That's going to confuse us. Let me take it off. The epidermis is avascular. It has no blood vessels. My question is asking about who does have blood vessels. The part of the skin that we definitely talked about having blood vessels is the dermis. I'll mention for us as well, though, that technically the hypodermis does also have blood vessels. Uh, the hypodermis has some really big blood vessels. So a big blood vessels found deeper in the skin. And then those blood vessels that help us do things like cool off and provide the nutrients we need for the epidermis. Those are the ones that are found in the dermis. Yeah, so, so Kira mentioned, and she's totally right, the hypodermis, we have to get through that layer to get blood to the dermis. So obviously these, these would have blood vessels too. So the dermis and the hypodermis have blood. There's that word, like I mentioned, that we used before, avascular. The epidermis, the outermost layer of the skin is avascular. So we've got no blood supply out there on its own. That's why the farther we get from the dermis, the more dead we are because we don't have, have blood supply out there. Our glycolipids also make us more dead, right? So the farther I get away from the blood vessels, as I grow farther and farther out, I also start to cover myself in glycolipids. What was the good thing about glycolipids? They do kill me the farther I get out, but they're also good. I have them for a reason. Yeah, exactly. So, so the glycolipids, the, the reason that I have them uh, is to make my skin waterproof, to make my skin waterproof. Remember that the lipids part of our name means that these things literally have fat in them. So think of this kind of like the raincoat on the outside of your skin. So we find these in the epidermis. They're really great for keeping water from the outside, outside but that also means they're blocking some of the water that would be coming from the inside trying to get out water like the liquid that comes in the blood from the dermis so remember that glycolipids end up killing our cells that live in stratum granulosum and go out farther those cells die because they're waterproof which means they're nutrient proof so glycolipids found in the epidermis keratin found in the epidermis. What about melanin? Where's melanin found? You see if I have a good, I guess I'll have to do, oh no, that's so sad. <laughs> Wrong button. Yeah, so melanin is found in the epidermis as well. Melanin made by the melanocytes that live in the epidermis. Here, let me circle all my things that I accidentally deleted. They're not going to be nearly as pretty as, as they were. 
All right. Last one that we have left is talking about the fingerprints. Which of my layers of the skin help us to make fingerprints? Yes, yeah, so it kind of comes from the interaction, right, of, of the dermis and the epidermis interacting together with each other. The dermis is going to be the one that most determines the shape, and then the epi epidermis grows on top of it, uh, leading you to actually see the fingerprints. I know one of my groups was mentioning the example that I gave you all uh, about my, my pyro student who really loved fire, <laughs> how if he wanted to change his fingerprints, he was going to have to go down and, and damage his dermis. He was going to have to have a second degree burn or a third degree burn to get rid of his fingerprints. We constantly shed our epidermis. Those cells fall off all the time. But because of the pattern that the dermis has, they'll always grow back in the same way. So dermis and epidermis, where they meet with each other, uh, that's how I form the fingerprints. But it really comes down to the dermis's shape that gives me gives me those fingerprints. Hey, I'm pretty sure that I gave you a, uh, a critical thinking question on exam two related to molecules. So we talked directly about glycolipids and about keratin and about melanin. I'm pretty sure that on exam two, I asked you guys which layers of the skin had hemoglobin. It seems like a totally random question. Do we remember where hemoglobin's found? Yeah, so I'm going to find hemoglobin. It's going to be in the dermis and the hypodermis. Yeah, exactly. Gerardo's totally right. Hemoglobin, we talked about this in unit number two when we were talking about sickle cell anemia. Remember that discussion from way back in the day? Hemoglobin is the oxygen transport protein that we have in red blood cells. So if we're talking about which layers of the skin have hemoglobin, what I'm really asking you is which layers of the skin have blood supply. Because if I don't have blood supply, I'm not going to have hemoglobin. So the correct answer, like several of us put in the chat, the layers of the skin that would have this hemoglobin protein, the dermis and the hypodermis, the places that we said had blood supply. So here's my pretty picture of the skin that comes from your lesson number seven packet. We've talked about a lot of, of the content. So We've got the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium up here. Notice how we have these things called epidermal ridges, where the epidermis is meeting the papillary layer of the dermis that's up high up here, the papillary layer. Then we have the much larger, <coughs> excuse me, reticular layer of the dermis, where we find things like the hair root and those sebaceous glands. Then we go down here. So the hypodermis, where we have that adipose tissue that, that we can see. I know there was a question in the chat earlier uh, about how keratin leads to the death of the cells that live up here. Uh, it Basically, the, the way that keratin leads to the death of these cells is it just takes up too much space. So keratinocytes are like completely filled with keratin. We have waterproofed them on the outside, so we can't really get any nutrients inside. And as we stop having nutrients and stop having organelles that function because they don't have enough nutrients to make ATP, all we have left is a cell that's completely filled up with keratin because we've made a whole bunch of keratin to make us strong. Uh, so it, it kind of uh, is a problem with the keratin killing us. I would say it's probably more of a problem that the glycolipids may starve us to death. So we're full of keratin, we can't eat or drink, that's why the cells in the outer part of the epidermis die. How do we feel about skin layers? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What do we think? Oh, 
By the way, I didn't ask you, I don't think, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think I asked you to learn thermal regulation again for the exam. Is that right? I can't remember there. I, I don't think that learning objective was on there. Kara doesn't know. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's highly possible that I did not ask you uh, to relearn thermal regulation. So that was the things like hypothermia and hyperthermia. Uh, but my question for you, which layer of the skin is most involved uh, in the process of, of thermoregulation? Do, can we tell? Yeah, so, so Kira and Kaylin are right for us. When we talk about the process of thermoregulation, we talked about how <clears throat> the big way your body does that is by changing the size of your blood vessels. So the outermost layer of the skin, the epidermis, we will radiate heat out of here. You're always losing heat that way. But especially if you're hot, you'll lose even more heat that way. So the dermis has the blood vessels that expand or contract based on whether you're hot or you're cold. So the dermis very heavily involved in thermoregulation. All right. <clears throat> Our last group activity was the fun one. We went through and, and talked about some of the brain structures that you might be using this week. Hopefully we're using all the brain structures this week, right? We're, we're really racking our brain hard. <laughs> but let's talk about some of the structures that would help us do particular things this week. Uh, so the first thing we might be doing this week is we might be feeling a little bit afraid or a little bit nervous about the exams. Which part of our brain makes us feel fear? Who makes us feel fear? Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're feeling, we're the, uh, the amygdaloid body or the amygdala. Let's see if I can spell that amygdaloid body underneath it. I'm going to put amygdala. This was the part of the brain that does fear and it also does what? Yeah. Like aggression, anger, rage, that kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll be back to the amygdala, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the fight or flight stuff, yep, coming from this part of the brain called the amygdaloid body or the amygdala. So we're feeling a little bit nervous about our exams, but when we try to study, we start to feel a little bit tired. What part of our brain is making us feel tired, especially when we're trying to study? Yeah, exactly. That pineal gland, right? The pineal gland. Hey, what does the pineal gland make that makes us feel so tired? Why are we feeling tired? Exactly. Melatonin. Yeah, I love it. Kaylin says melatonin spilling everywhere. That's perfect. That, that's what happens every time we sit down to study, right? The pineal gland is like, cue me in. It's time to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we could, could use some bright light therapy, right? We can study in front of a window or like shine a light straight in our face, you know, try to reset that pineal gland, right? Except when we're trying to sleep and then we can't sleep, which part of our brain would be keeping us awake when we're trying to go to sleep? Exactly, yep, so the, the big long name of this part of our brain is the reticular activating system. The short abbreviation for it is RAS. Remember, this is the thing that, that when we learned about it in lesson 11, I told you this is what you can be cursing when you're awake all night, right? Especially now when it's, it's a, a crazy stressful time of the semester, it's hard for us to turn off the reticular activating system, right? We keep sending pings up to our brain Hey, it relates back to that. Remember that article we talked about from, from unit number three, the article about how when you don't finish something, when there's some kind of suspense in your mind, you can't stop thinking about it. So I'm pretty sure that that's where we're at right now. We're all turning on our reticular activating system 100% of the time because we're always not quite done studying. It's never quite good enough, right? except when we sit down to study. And then our brain's like, oh, we got this. It is nap time. <laughs> uh, 
All right, we're also trying to balance things. Now, I, I gave us a picture for, for physically balancing thing. That's probably the easiest thing for us to come up with an answer for here. So if we're trying to stay physically balanced, like Dr. Aulis on her ball, juggling, juggling things. Yeah, exactly. We're talking about the cerebellum. That was the part of the brain that helped us out with balancing. So I, I don't even know what answer we would pick if we were, if we were trying to say uh, that we're doing like emotional could be like the limbic system maybe, or uh, maybe the frontal lobe of the brain where your personality comes from if we're, we're trying to, to do this internally. But it's just much easier to say that, yeah, we're balancing on a ball right now because that's about, about how it feels like, right? <laughs> hey, before I, I flip to the next slide, which of these four, of these four, do we most relate to? What do we think? Where are we at right now? Being afraid, being tired, staying awake all night, or just trying to balance. The balancing. Okay, got lots of us balancing. Reticular activating system. Yeah, the tired. Yeah, afraid and tired. Uh, so Fanchon asked a clarifying question about the basal nuclei. Um, they, they would possibly be involved in, in balance as well. Remember that the basal nuclei, their job was kind of to prevent unwanted movements. So the, the best way to think about the basal nuclei, remember, is when we talked about Parkinson's disease, where people have tremors, so constant movements that don't stop, uh, and also those tics that we saw in Tourette's syndrome. So whether it's a motor movement or a vocal sound, uh, the big thing with basal nuclei is, is, like I said, they stop unwanted movements. The cerebellum makes the movements we want to do look nice. And then if you remember the precentral gyrus with the motor homunculus, that's where you decided what you wanted to do. So three different movement structures. <laughs> yeah, Kaylin mentioned, unless you're drunk. <laughs> yeah, if, if we're drunk, there would be none of this balancing going on, right? Your cerebellum very easily inhibited uh, by by alcohol. So when we're drunk, we are are doing all kinds of silly things. We look like a drunk person when our cerebellum's not working. <laughs> all right, so we were across the board on these things, right? I know from talking with uh, several of my groups <laughs> that I, ha I had several of you that were in this boat right here, right? With with our our angry about those review statements. So uh, let's start here. What part of the brain did we say was what, was what made us angry? We already talked about this one with fear, right? It also makes us angry. Yep, the amygdala, the amygdala, or the big long name, amygdaloid body. Yep, that's what happens when we get our 95% when we were so sure we had 100%. <laughs> Remember, you can do those assignments as much or as little as you want. I promise I'm not going to judge you if you decide that an 89.5 is good enough for you or that a 93.5 is good enough for you. So do it until it's not helpful anymore and then don't waste your time on it, right? Just move on. It's all good. Or if we're really shooting for that, that 20, right? Maybe we need some coffee. What is the part of the brain, this is actually a limbic system structure, that makes us feel good or feel something when we smell coffee? Yep, the olfactory bulb. Olfactory bulb. Hey, I, I got several of you that, that did the current events article about how people who like the taste sensation bitter like coffee more. I'm totally uh, on the track with bitter taste stints. That is my jam. Um, yeah, not everybody. Several of the people who, who did that article for me, they were like, I do not like ca coffee. And I'm thinking like, oh, you poor person. Like, uh, props to you for surviving anatomy without coffee. Like, man, it is, it is coffee time all the time <laughs> over here. I do love me some good coffee. All right. Then we got this fun one, right? This is, this is what we do when we uh, are supposed to be studying. If we're not getting sleepy, um, we're probably getting distracted, right? And we're remembering what kind of life we had before anatomy back in the day. Was there life before anatomy? 
we, we can't even remember anymore, right? That's the job of our hippocampus, like several of us are, are saying in here. Remember that the hippocampus is the one part of the brain that is always growing. Everybody else is done. The hippocampus is still growing. So we're always making new memories, hopefully good new memories. <laughs> um, hey, I like that. Kaylin's like, I was so dumb before anatomy. Yeah, look at you. You've grown, right? So this person might look happy. They might look rested in your memories. Uh, you've lost so much sw sleep and so many tears and sweat for anatomy, but you are way smarter than you were before you started. So look at you. Last thing that we all have to keep doing, right? Especially when we're taking the, the exam, we got to take those deep breaths, right? So when we're, when we're taking the exam, when we're studying for the exam, we got to get our pawns going. Remember that was the thing that had the pontine respiratory center, pontine respiratory center that helped you with your breathing rate. We also have the medulla, medulla oblongata, that had the medullary rhythmicity center. Too long. I liked, by the way, uh, I think, Kaylin, you were the one that said this, right? So if you go to take the exam, either your medulla could activate to help you breathe or your medulla could activate to make you vomit, right? <laughs> Remember that the, the medulla oblongata helps us with, with vomiting reflexes as well. So. Maybe it's going to tell you to breathe. Maybe it's going to tell you to throw up. Maybe it's going to tell you to do both, <laughs> but it'll be there when we're taking our exam, right? So um, all, of, all of these things, things that we're experiencing now, or we probably will experience between now and, and the end of the semester. Which one of these four are we at? We were kind of all over the board on the other one. Which one of these bitmojis do we most relate to? Yeah, I'm with Brittany, feeling the coffee. <laughs> Kira's reminiscing about simpler times. <laughs> all of them. Temi Teo says all four in one. <laughs> I like it. Okay, good, Kaylin. I was afraid you were going to put everything except the breathing. So I, I, I like that. The memories, the coffee, the breathing. <laughs> I'm surprised that a lot of us are, are not, we're, we're high, we're closet angry, right? <laughs> closet angry at Dr. Aulis. That's okay. Yeah, we want to breathe, but we might throw up. Hey, it, it's all the medulla, medulla in action. Love it. All right. Uh, something, let me see. We did not talk last time about the process of hearing and balance. That was something that was on our list to review. We also had mentioned that we wanted to talk about endochondral ossification. Which would you all prefer first? I think we should have plenty of time to talk about bowls. Okay, I got several votes for bones. So we'll go with bones and then we will we'll flip back over to, to that stuff. There's one other, let me see what my other one was that I pulled. Oh yeah, we also mentioned that we wanted to talk about our spaces. So we'll do those and then we'll bounce back to, uh, to hearing and balance. <laughs> uh, to your question, Kaylin, I, I do not know on a scale of one to 10 how bad you'll feel. I suspect because you have been preparing and you're continuing to review your stuff, I suspect it's not gonna be a terrible exam. Um, Generally, students do about as well as normal, if not better than normal. Um, just take your time and breathe. These are not the same questions that you have seen before, uh, but it's the same concepts that you've seen before. And we've really worked on uh, training ourselves at how to approach Dr. Ellis's critical thinking questions, right? We're getting better at that. So uh, I, I think it's, I think it's going to be okay. How evil was my laugh when I did the exam? <laughs> um, I, I don't think, I think compared to some of the other exams, it was a little bit less evil. Doesn't mean you shouldn't study as much, but I think it's maybe a little bit less evil. Uh, how many questions? I believe it's in the ballpark of 60 questions. A few of them have more than one part. 
Um, so I, I think it ends up being around 80 points, maybe. Uh, so that means that some of them have more than one part to it. You'll have 80 minutes to take the exam. So a little bit longer than usual. Um, Kira asked if they'll be select all questions. Uh, honestly, I can't remember if I had put that kind on there. I think there might be a few select alls. Yes. Um, yeah, so Audrey, it'll be kind of a mix of, of the kinds of questions from unit number four and then some of the earlier units as well. So some questions that maybe feel a little bit more straightforward, uh, some that are going to make you apply stuff as well. Uh, I'll mention too that there are actually a couple of extra credit questions on the exam. Uh, so do your best and maybe you can, can offset something you got wrong or get extra credit. Um, the three for one special I do. Yep, that's my favorite, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, Audrey, what you mean by a lot of a lot of reading uh, or drop down menus. I, I would suspect a lot of them are the drop down menu like we're used to. Um, sometimes there's more than one statement in a question, so like two or three different questions inside one to answer, like we're used to um, on, on exams that we've seen before. Um, Barbara asked if we have to take it. Yes, uh, everyone has to take it unless you want to drop your grade by 10%, uh, then go for it because <laughs> it's worth 10% of your lecture grade. Um, so if you're happy with where you're at minus 10%, then I guess you could not take it, but I recommend everybody take it. <laughs> um, let's see, we're excited about the extra credit. Absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, Kaylin, there, there will be some material from the last unit on the exam, alas. <laughs> but the good news is the stuff from the last exam, we just covered it. So we, we should have it a little bit more fresh in our mind. I know somebody had mentioned that, uh, the learning objective list they thought was a little bit hard for them to use to study. Let me pull it up just to show you all. Uh, to mention what I think, how I think it could be helpful for you. So let me find it really fast. And I'll share my screen with you once it pops up. I'm going to zoom it in so that when it comes up. It's a little bit bigger. This is posted for you in your folder. Uh, that's learning objectives for the for the final exam. If uh, so, there's a couple of things you could do with this. The thing that at this point, as we're getting ready for the exam, as in like it's due tomorrow, at this point, what I do not want you to do with this is I don't want you to go through and rewrite your notes to match this. That's what I don't want you to do because we don't have enough time for that. What I think could be a helpful thing for you to do is to take this list and get a highlighter or a colored pen or something like that. Look at the, the learning objectives that are listed here. These are the exact same things that, that are at the top of each of your lecture packets. So it goes in order. So when we're looking at our, our learning objectives, oops, let me find my pointer here. Okay, so we're looking at our, our learning objectives. For example, right here, this one, number nine, talks about the structure of the plasma membrane. That's like the first thing in unit number, or lesson number three, I think. So I could take my highlighter or my, my colored pen. This talks about drawing the plasma membrane. You can put a little bracket or highlight the part in your notes where it shows the plasma membrane. Highlight your parts in your notes where you've labeled the heads and the tails, polar and nonpolar, that kind of stuff. Then we go into a learning objective that talks about how the bonds are formed. Highlight that part of your notes so you know to look at it. Highlight the parts that talk about what these things do with water, uh, the parts that tells you what can and can't get across. When you go through and look at your packet with these learning objectives, there will be parts of that packet that you'll end up not having highlighted those are the parts that don't waste your study time studying that information. 
Remember we talked about the tonic words, hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic? That did not make this list. So we don't want to waste our study time on that because I'm not going to ask you any questions. I promise you that all the questions you see on the exam are going to come from this information. So the ideas that are on here are the things that you will be tested on. The things that are not on here, you won't be tested on. So for example, we go to, to unit number two. When you look at the stuff about the skin, I don't ask you about skin cancer. So don't study skin cancer because it's not going to be on the exam. Or when we're looking at, um, I think there was some bone stuff. I can't remember off the top of my head. I know there are a few bone things. Uh, I don't remember, uh, but, but compare this to your, if you look at, here's all my bone stuff right here. So endochondral ossification down to here, that's seven learning objectives. The front of that packet probably has 15. So use this to help you to know what topics in, in that packet you don't have to know. Don't waste your study time on stuff that you don't see in here. I'm trying to remember. I do not ask you, let me confirm this. I don't ask you about reflexes on the final exam. So we're down here into unit number four. I'm not gonna ask you about reflexes on the final exam. I want us to know the difference between ascending and descending tracks, but I'm not gonna make you know reflexes. So, uh, and I apologize, I don't know off the top of my head what all I cut, uh, but you can go through and find what got cut and don't study that. So. Don't go through and, and organize, reorganize your notes and build a new thing to study from. We don't have time, but use this to help you know, hey, I really don't feel good about that topic. Oh, look, it's not on the exam anyway, so we're good. Let me look at the chatter we had while I was looking at that. Yeah, so Fanchon mentioned that she looked at this list and, and she she went with the ones that she couldn't explain or she didn't understand. That's the ones that she looked at the video from our class session. I like that. Yeah, and somebody had mentioned, I can't remember exactly who, uh, and Fanchon's reiterating, a good idea too, if you really like uh, to review things by hearing them, you can totally watch these class sessions at two times speed. Dr. Aulis talks super fast. Okay, so yeah, Brittany, I was thinking it might've come from you, Brittany, originally, yep. So you can go back and watch all of our class sessions. Um, gosh, probably don't watch everything <laughs> at this point. There's not enough hours in the day, right? Dr. Aulis talks too much. But uh, go back any of the ones that you're feeling pretty bad about or you just want to update yourself on. You can, you can make me talk real fast and we can review stuff together. The other thing too, I'm sure you all have figured this out, the review assignments are also a really awesome way to prepare, uh, but you're going to want to do them multiple times because it can only pull, I think that the note says it pulls about a quarter of the questions out of the pool. And I have pulled content from each of, of these learning objectives to put into, into that pool. So use those assignments to quiz yourself too, to figure out what you do and don't know. Any other questions before I do endochondral ossification? Are we all mind blown? We've gone silent. Hmm. Yeah, I get, I, I, I feel you. Your mind hurts. We're a little bit numb. We're not sleeping. <laughs> We're so close to done though. I, I promise it's going to feel awesome when you're done. I know it's, it's a hard work between now and then, but we're, we're really close. Keep breathing, keep reviewing, take the exam and rejoice and celebrate because you definitely earned it. <laughs> Yeah, so Audrey mentioned that she's feeling feeling nervous about it. Um, really, again, one of the, the best pieces of advice I can give you for that is take those practice assignments like they're the exam. Try to lock it down. Try to, you know, take everything off your desk. Give yourself a time limit 
and try those assignments pretending like they're the exam because that will give you a, a way to, to try to practice what it'll be like with, with the material. Yes, I, I agree. Kaylin's sending some love. Fanchon is, is encouraging Audrey. We all know our stuff. We know more than we think we do. When you sit down to the exam, remind yourself of that. I know more than I think I do. I am afraid of this exam, but I know this stuff. I've done this stuff all semester. So keep breathing. Uh, keep going through. If you hit a question you don't know the answer to, go back to it later. Move on and find stuff that you do know. Because I guarantee you at least two thirds of the exam, you'll look at that question and you'll know the answer right away. So don't get caught up on that stuff that, that you don't know. Come back to it later. Give yourself extra time to think about that, but do the things that, that you do know when you know them right away. <laughs> I will, I'll do my best to be nice, Kaylin. I, I will try. <laughs> All right, let's talk about endochondral ossification really fast here. Endochondral ossification. This is one of the, the learning objectives that we, we had left over on our list. Remember that endochondral ossification means inside cartilage bone building. Inside cartilage bone building, endochondral ossification. So this is a process that starts around week nine of fetal development. Even before week nine, we start to build a cartilage model for your bones. But it's around week nine when we start to get messages uh, the, the cells that live inside the bone tissue, or excuse me, the, the cartilage model, the chondrocytes get messages that, hey, you're going to be changed into bone. So the first step of endochondral ossification is we put this, this uh, bad bone or poorly developed bone on the outside of, of our cartilage model. So we build this thing called a bone collar. The bone collar is found on the part of the bone called the diaphysis. That's a lab review word. The diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. We have uh, this bone collar on the outside of the bone because we, it, it's time for us to start building bone tissue. We've gotten large enough as cartilage that the cells in the middle of, of this model start to die. They start to calcify. As they grab the calcium around us, we put down really poor quality bone. Well, that poor quality bone and these dying chondrocytes brings over a nutrient artery that comes into the diaphysis, into the place where those chondrocytes have died. When that blood vessel comes in, it's too little too late for the chondrocytes. They didn't have, have energy, they've died but the blood vessel brings with it osteoblasts, the bone builders. So when we do endochondral ossification, we first start building bone in the diaphysis, in the shaft of the bone. So the primary ossification center, the first place where we build good bone is here in the shaft of the bone, the diaphysis of the bone. The reason I get a nutrient artery into the diaphysis of the bone is because my chondrocytes that lived in there kind of sent out an SOS message. They were dying. They didn't have enough nutrients. This bone collar on the outside blocked them. So they die. In comes the nutrient artery. We form the primary ossification center in the diaphysis of the bone. As we get closer to the time of birth, we only have bone tissue left in the diaphysis of the bone. The blood vessels have brought in enough nutrients and brought in enough bone cells to fill the diaphysis completely with bone. But we still have the cartilage that I find at the epiphyses, at the ends of the bone. So right around the time of birth, shortly after the time of birth, we also send blood vessels into the epiphyses or into the ends of the bone. So the epiphyses or the ends of the bone are where we find these things called secondary ossification centers. The secondary ossification centers come in second, they happen later, and they're found in the ends of the bone. 
So early development of a baby, they're starting to build bony tissue in the epiphyses, in the ends of the bone. Into adulthood, we will always see this cartilage tissue that's left on the end, complete end of the bone called the articular cartilage, where we would form a joint. If we're in our teens or low 20s, anything below that, we would still see, remember, the epiphyseal plate where there's cartilage left between the epiphysis and the diaphysis of the bone. The epiphyseal plate, we called in easy person words, the growth plate. As long as a person still has these epiphyseal plates, this cartilage tissue in here, they will still be able to grow taller. Their bones are getting longer. But when the epiphyseal plate turns into an epiphyseal line, when it's all bone tissue, we can no longer grow any taller. The process of growth is complete. We're at the height we're going to stay at. So an epiphyseal line means no more growth. An epiphyseal plate means we will be growing. Make sure to take a moment to peek at those x-rays that we looked at together in class. Uh, or, or do a quick Google search for epiphyseal plate and epiphyseal line. I'm promising you that there will be an x-ray picture on the exam. It'll be obvious if you know what you're looking for, but we need to know if we do or don't see an epiphyseal plate, and we need to know if that means we are growing or we are not growing. Uh, Fanchon asks if we need to know about the layers of the growth plate. That is a learning objective that got pulled off the list. So we don't need to go back through with the zone of hypertrophy, uh, the zone of calcified cartilage. You don't have to know that. We just need to know that there's still cartilage there if you've got an epiphyseal plate. And when you look at an x-ray, that looks like floating bones. If I see an x-ray that's completely solid, there's no floating bones, I have an epiphyseal line, which means I'm done growing. So good example, like Fanchon brought up for us there, good example of something that we learned during the semester that we don't have to know on the final. Don't waste your review time on those zones in the epiphyseal plate. Briefly, I'll mention, because a few of us asked to talk about uh, the different spaces around the spinal cord. Remind me, because we've said this a lot, what do I find in the epidural space around the spinal cord? What's in the epidural space? Yeah, exactly. Here's my yellow adipose tissue. So there's adipose tissue in that epidural space. What was the medical significance of this space for us? Why did we even talk about the epidural space? Yeah, exactly. Like here mentioned. That's where a woman can get an epidural. This is where epidural anesthesia is inserted. Now remember, at the epidural space, the beginning part epi means above. The epidural space is above the dura mater. So this is the most superficial space. I find it between the vertebrae and the dura mater, the epidural space. Remember, I think I even had us do this when we were looking at this picture together. The subdural space is not real. It's only there when you die. So there's not actually space underneath the dura mater. Uh, it's, it's very close to the arachnoid mater, the arachnoid mater. But then underneath the arachnoid mater, we have that thing called the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid means that we are below the arachnoid mater. What do I find in the subarachnoid space where I see all these little spiderweb lines? What do I find inside of there? Yeah, exactly. That's where my CSF is, my cerebrospinal fluid. So if we're talking about a spinal tap where we would be removing cerebrospinal fluid, this is the space we're gonna go for, the subarachnoid space. Hey, it is below the arachnoid mater. 
It is above what? What layer are we in between? Yeah, exactly. So the subarachnoid space is below the arachnoid mater, but it's above the pia mater, or it's in between my deepest meningeal layer, the pia mater, and my intermediate meningeal layer, the arachnoid mater. That's the one that's in the middle. So two spaces, epidural, above everything. That's where my adipose tissue is. Subarachnoid space underneath the arachnoid mater with the cerebrospinal fluid. In closing, our last topic, let me pull up hearing and balance really fast since we didn't quite get to that last time. Here's the crash course down and dirty, what we need to know about, about these processes. Remember that table that, that we filled out uh, during our group work last time, hearing and balance. It's all about the numbers. It's a numbers game. So when you are sitting in your room and Dr. Aulis is not talking, which is not nearly enough, right? When you're sitting in your room waiting to hear what Dr. Aulis has to say, your hair cells are sending a few neurotransmitters. We're sending a very few number of messages because we're listening and we're not hearing anything. So small number of impulses that are activating the reticular activating system. We're staying awake, we're listening. When you start to hear noises, because the basilar membrane starts bouncing, it pushes these hair cells into the tectorial membrane. When they bump the tectorial membrane, in comes my ions to depolarize the hair cell and out goes all of my neurotransmitters. So when you're hearing something, tons and tons of messages. When we're waiting to hear something, a few messages, we're waiting. When we've just finished hearing something, when we're sending those sound waves out into the trash, scala timpani for the trash, we don't send out any messages at that point because we're we're pushing the mechanically gated channels on this cell shut so we push the channel shut that means no message is released we push them open when we're hearing something all the messages released just one or two of them opened a few messages released the process of hearing is all about the number of messages a lot a little or none. That's what we want to know about the process of hearing. Our two kinds of balance are, are the same way. When your head is upright, we have a slow and steady number of impulses that are telling us that we are, are not bending forward or backwards. So this is equilibrium relative to gravity. We call that static equilibrium, static equilibrium. We have a slow and steady number of impulses when our head is upright, when it's going the right way. When our head starts to bend forward, just like when we heard a sound, we bend forward and push open all of those mechanically gated channels. That leads to a ton of messages. So when our head goes forward, lots of messages because our little autoliths, these little crystals up here, they push open the mechanically gated channels that I find on my hair cells. When your head starts to bend backwards, we're pushing those, some of those channels closed. So very few messages when we're going backwards, a ton of messages when we're going forwards, a slow and steady number of messages when our head is upright. By the way, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Static equilibrium is done in the parts of the ear called the saccule and the utricle. Static equilibrium uses those little crystals called autoliths. We also have that thing called the autolithic membrane. 
a good list for you to make would be the structures involved in static equilibrium, like this one that we just saw here. Also, dynamic equilibrium. When we're doing dynamic equilibrium, remember that we've got this thing that we call the cupola. The cupola involved in dynamic equilibrium. Yeah, Kira's right. What we should have added to our list too for static equilibrium, all the stuff I used to hear, or excuse me, all the stuff I used to do static equilibrium together called the macula. So we've got the macula in, I'll go back here, all of this receptor, everything that I see right here, we call that the macula. How you do static equilibrium, all this stuff, the macula. How I do dynamic equilibrium, all this stuff, the cupula. How does, how does dynamic equilibrium work? Well, when we're upright, the fluid that's in our ears is pushing a few of the, is pushing on the cupula and a few of my neurotransmitters are being released slow and steady. When you start turning, that fluid takes a little bit of time to catch up. All the neurotransmitters spit out because we're pushing open our channels. When we stop moving, we push those channels closed. We don't have any neurotransmitters released. Normal number, a ton, none. That's our, our series for dynamic equilibrium, rotational. Remember, it's things like the cupula. It's things like endolymph fluid. And um, it's things like hair cells. There's some hair cells right there, hair cells. We are officially out of time. Are there any last minute specific questions you'd like to ask before I end the recording? Yeah, I do think we need a penguin. Let me get a whiteboard. I'll draw us a big penguin. Friendly reminder that when you're taking the exam, if anything goes wrong, please get in touch with Proctorio first. I cannot get you back into your exam. Regardless of how much time you have left, I can't get you back into it. So please, Proctorio, right away. Uh, they can get you back into your exam. I am not able to do that. But do get in touch with me afterwards as well, uh, just so that I, I know that they were able to take care of you. Best of luck on the final. This is your happy anatomy penguin telling you congratulations. You survived. Dr. Ross is rooting for you. So proud of all of you. Best of luck on that exam. And if you happen to be going to uh, Northeast campus in the fall, please come find me. I am in Science West building. So I would love to meet you in person to put a face to uh, your name. So good luck on the exam. Reach out with via email with any questions you have. And remember that tomorrow I'm available from 10 to 12 and 1 to, to 2.30. So stop by if you have any questions. Best of luck on the exam.